for this week, I'm very, very pleased to be able to, to, to present Dr. Pravati Prem. Uh, Dr. Prem, she's received her bachelor's, master's, and PhDs, all in aerospace engineering. She did her bachelor's degree at Nanyang Technological Institute in Singapore. And then she received her master's and PhD at the University of Texas, Austin. As I understand it from looking at her website and also from talking to her, she was initially interested in, in, in of course, aerodynamics and then looking at the aerodynamics of things like kites and birds. And, and then she found planetary science at, at, at the University of Austin, and now she studies airless bodies. So what she's going to talk about today is what I think is some of the work that she at least had started as a grad student at UT Austin in investigating where does the water that we've observed on the moon come from. And so after she finished her PhD in 2017, Parvati joined the, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab as a postdoc. And since this year, she's now a staff science, staff scientist in Applied Physics Lab. So it's great to have you and we look forward to, to your talk. All right, thanks so much, Mike, for that introduction. And, um, and thank you all for dialing in. It's, it's always great to meet new people and especially if they're geologists. So let me share my screen here. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. I'm gonna assume you can see it and you can hear me, uh, but if you don't, give me a shout. Um, all right, so my talk today is about water on the moon. And the moon is a strange place to study water because of course, there's not a whole lot of it compared to this ocean world next door on which all of us live. But one of the beautiful things about the moon is that the lunar surface has recorded the last four and a half billion years of our solar system neighborhood's history in ways that have really been erased on Earth. And so the story of water on the moon is in many ways also the story of water on Earth. And to remind myself to tell you that, the background image on this slide is the crescent Earth rising above the lunar horizon um, as photographed by Apollo 14 on its way home. So before we get into the science, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where I work. I am a staff scientist at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, APL, in Maryland. I'm dialing in today from my home in Columbia, Maryland. Um, so APL, we are a university affiliated research center, among other things, we build and operate spacecraft for several NASA planetary missions, and we have a whole bunch of scientists and engineers who drive that and analyze the data that those spacecraft send back. Uh, I am a member of the planetary exploration group, which has the completely non intuitive acronym of SRE. Um, SRE is mostly astronomers, geologists, and a few physicists and engineers like me um, who study all of the other worlds of our solar system. Uh, we have seven sections. I am actually a member of the spectroscopy section. And so although there's not much spectroscopy in this talk today, you, you can ask me later if you like what my favorite wavelength is, and I may or may not give you a straight answer. Uh, but that's APL, that's SRE. And our story today of water on the moon starts at the lunar poles. So on this slide, you're looking at two views of the lunar south polar region as photographed in visible light on the left here and in thermal infrared on the right hand side. The lunar poles are some of the coldest places in the solar system. If you look at the visible image here, you'll notice that there are some regions in this photograph that are in shadow, especially the interiors of some of the larger craters. And in fact, due to the orientation of the moon's spin axis as it orbits, this, uh, orbits the sun, the, uh, many of the regions that are in shadow in this image haven't actually seen sunlight for more than 2 billion years. And so these are permanently shadowed regions. And if you look at the temperature map, you'll notice that temperatures, the average temperatures in some of those permanently shadowed regions 
are extraordinarily cold. And in fact, they're so cold that a whole range of normally volatile ices from sulfur all the way down to carbon dioxide and even lower temperatures, a whole range of these ices can be stable over geological timescales of billions of years. And there's a star here that marks the one point for which we have actual ground truth data. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the idea is that when you have these regions in the inner solar system as part of the Earth Moon system, the idea is that these permanently shadowed regions have acted as cold storage for volatiles arriving in the Earth Moon system over the past several billions of years. And so the story of water on the moon is tied to a lot of really big questions. Lunar water is, is related to the question of how water originated in the inner solar system, including on our planet, the other partner in the Earth Moon system. Um, whether the moon has an active water cycle today is something that's driven a lot of my research and something that remains a topic of, of great scientific interest. And then as we think about perhaps returning to the moon and exploring the solar system in, in new and exciting ways, um, there's also this question of whether this water could potentially be a viable resource. And so we've known for several decades that the lunar poles are a place like really nowhere else in the inner solar system. And there have been a number of missions that have studied um, and looked for traces of water on the moon uh, from orbit. So for instance, neutron spectroscopy is sensitive to hydrogen in the upper meter or so of the lunar regolith. And we know from the neutrons that the poles are enriched in subsurface hydrogen, whether that's water ice or something else, we're not entirely sure, but we know the hydrogen is there. And then over the last 10 years, there have been a variety of spectroscopic observations of different flavors that have indicated that in at least some of those cold shadowed craters, you have patchy exposures of water ice near the surface. Around 10 years ago in 2009, the Elcross mission undertook uh, a really intrepid um, expedition. It carried out a controlled crash into Cabeus Crater, which is roughly where this red circle is here. And that controlled crash kicked up a plume of debris that we could then analyze when those grains and gas um, reached sunlight. And Elcross detected not just water, but a whole range of other species. Um, some simple hydrocarbons, hydrogen sulfide, a whole host of, of other interesting volatiles. But ultimately, where we are after a decade, perhaps two, of, um, of orbital exploration is that we have pretty good indicators that water is there. Its origin remains almost entirely unknown. And there are major outstanding questions when it comes to its abundance, how it's distributed, and also its physical form. And this, one of the reasons why this is such an interesting topic to explore um, is that if we take a step back and think about it, the water molecule has really played a starring role in the history of the Earth Moon system. Our current best guess for how the moon formed is that around four and a half billion years ago, an object about the size of Mars collided with the proto Earth. Um, resulting in a cloud of debris that coalesced to form the moon. And we know water was present in the Earth moon system at that time, but how much of that water aggregated in the lunar interior is something that remains a subject of, of active investigation. Once the moon formed, the moon and the Earth were bombarded um, by all the debris left over from planetary uh, formation. The lunar surface was bombarded by asteroids and comets, and several of those asteroids and comets may have brought water, in fact, almost certainly brought water to the lunar surface. From around three and a half billion years ago to around one billion uh, years ago, the lunar surface underwent a period of widespread global volcanism. And those eruptions carried volatiles uh, water was a relatively minor species. In the case of lunar volcanism, it was mostly carbon monoxide, we think, 
Uh, but nevertheless, those volcanic eruptions carried volatiles from the interior to the surface. And even today, when the moon appears relatively quiet, um, the, the, moon, the lunar surface continues to be bombarded by micrometeoroids, those, those tiny impactors, um, and even things that are you know, maybe slightly bigger, things that would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. The lunar surface continues to be bombarded by these little projectiles that can release water from the surface, and also the solar wind. Um, so I always think it's kind of magical that sunlight can create water from rock. Um, because what we think happens is that the solar wind, so that stream of hydrogen ions um, streaming out from the sun, interacts with oxygen in, in a silicate surface. Uh, sometimes that can form H2O or uh, more commonly OH. And so that is another one of those continuous contemporary sources of water along with the micrometeoroids. And then we have the um, the more dramatic, episodic, ancient sources, the impacts and the volcanic eruptions of several billion years ago. And since many of these are, you know, especially the impacts and the volcanic eruptions are processes that are long gone and things that we can't observe anymore, numerical models, um, and I'm in the business of building some of those numerical models, but numerical models provide um, really a critical means to reconstruct some of those scenarios and just as importantly try and figure out what evidence of these ancient um, events might be preserved today on the lunar surface. The other part of this puzzle, so we've talked a little bit about volatiles on the lunar surface. Volatiles are also present in the lunar exosphere. So the moon has an exceedingly thin atmosphere. In fact, it's, it's hardly there at all. Um, but this is how someone majored in aerodynamics and ended up studying airless bodies, because in fact, the most common kind of atmosphere in the solar system is actually the thin atmosphere. It's the kind of atmosphere that's hardly there at all, which is sometimes referred to as a surface boundary exosphere. And we can sort of think about this by thinking about the mean free path, which is the average distance that two molecules in an atmosphere move before they collide with each other. So the air around us is buzzing with molecules, they're colliding with each other, they're exchanging energy. The mean free path is how far they travel on average before they encounter another molecule. On Earth and on some of the moons of our solar system, uh, the mean free path is on the order of 100 nanometers, which is tiny. As we move out further into the solar system, atmospheres generally become thinner, uh, but they can still be very dynamic. So for instance, Io, Jupiter's moon, is the most volcanically active object in the solar system today, but it has um, an exceedingly thin atmosphere in which molecules travel around 100 meters before they encounter another molecules. Comets are interesting because of course they outgas as they approach the sun. And so the density of a comet's um, atmosphere, the density of the comet's coma varies uh, as it travels um, towards and away from the sun. And the moon today um, has, it does, it has, it, it does have this thin shroud of an atmosphere, but it's really hardly there at all. It, it is really an exosphere. Uh, molecules hardly ever collide with each other. In fact, if you do the math, they travel thousands of kilometers before they would encounter an other molecule, which is almost never. But the fascinating thing about the moon is that the moon has, has traveled across the space during its history. We know that, uh, or we have very good reason to think that there have been intervals of time in the past, for instance, shortly after the moon formed, then again in the aftermath of comet impacts, in the aftermath of these volatile rich impacts, and perhaps during periods of volcanism as well, we know that the lunar atmosphere has gone through periods when it might have been much thicker. So the moon is a fascinating place to go to understand how atmospheres rise and fall throughout the solar system. And when it comes to understanding the origins of lunar water, it becomes important, in, in my opinion at least, to, to understand um, how a collisionless exosphere 
uh, transforms into a temporary rarefied but, but thin atmosphere and how that atmosphere fades away and, and where those volatiles, including the water that might be released, where all of that goes. And so one of the things I do um, is to try and understand that process through numerical simulations. All right, so getting into the weeds a little bit, how do we make an atmosphere from scratch? Well, one of the, um, when we're dealing with an atmosphere that's exceedingly thin, one of the most physically accurate ways to understand the behavior of a rarefied, very thin atmosphere is to model the gas dynamics of that atmosphere by modeling the behavior of a large number of molecules. So ultimately, every atmosphere is made up of molecules. And to get a physically accurate picture of how an atmosphere rises and falls, in, um, especially when it's towards the verified end of, of the spectrum of solar system atmospheres, um, one of the best ways to do that is to recreate the atmosphere by looking at the behavior of molecules. And so in this presentation today, I'm going to share with you two, um, two case studies, if you will. So we're going to look at uh, a temporary atmosphere generated by a comet impact on the moon. And then we're going to look at a very different kind of atmosphere, um, a much thinner atmosphere, but one that's generated in an interesting way by the water vapor released by a spacecraft when it burns rocket fuel and releases, among other things, water into the lunar exosphere. So we're going to look at those two case studies. And in both those cases, um, we can initialize our simulations in, in, different, in similar but different ways. So for instance, in the case of a comet impact, um, I work with colleagues who use a hydrodynamic code to model the evolution of uh, water vapor after an icy body strikes a silicate surface. That gives you a picture of the density, temperature, and velocity near the newly forming impact crater. We can use that density, temperature, and velocity um, to create representative molecules. Similarly, in the case of a spacecraft, we have some idea of, of what um, the, the jet coming out of a spacecraft uh, engine looks like, and we can use those properties to generate simulated molecules. So once you've created your molecules using some set of appropriate initial conditions, what we do then is to track those molecules. And we're talking about millions of molecules here, but they all behave uh, in very similar ways. So in between collisions, molecules, like everything else, uh, travel under the influence of gravity. So molecules travel along ballistic trajectories. Whenever a molecule encounters another molecule, uh, which happens frequently when the atmosphere is thick and less frequently when the atmosphere is thin, molecules can collide with each other. They exchange internal and kinetic energy. They can sometimes even undergo chemical reactions when they collide. Um, molecules also interact with the lunar surface. When a molecule strikes the lunar surface, it can absorb to that surface, and the nature of absorption depends on the local surface temperature. And they can also react chemically with the surface or diffuse into the subsurface. And of course, if a molecule lands in one of those permanently shattered regions where water and other volatiles are th uh, thermally stable, uh, molecules can remain absorbed or frozen for exceedingly long periods of time. On a low gravity body, um, like the moon, molecules sometimes pick up enough energy that they can escape gravity altogether. Also, water vapor, as, as I'm sure all of you know, is a greenhouse gas. And so sometimes it becomes important to consider how water molecules absorb infrared radiation, whether that's infrared radiation coming from the lunar surface or infrared radiation that's being spontaneously emitted and reabsorbed. Now, I mentioned that all of these molecules, or rather, all of these atmospheres are temporary. You know the moon doesn't have an atmosphere today, so whatever a comet impact did or whatever a volcanic eruption brought to the surface, it's, it's hardly there anymore. And the great destroyer of water molecules on the moon is the sun. 
Um, solar ultraviolet tends to dissociate H2O into um, H2, or, or rather H and OH and, and other species. Um, when you have species other than water, you can get a whole range of interesting photochemistry. And so the reason I, I show you the slide um, is to emphasize that even though these atmospheres are thin, there, there is a real, there's a really rich physics and chemistry going on here. Um, and almost every single one of these processes that I've labeled here is something that, that people are actively working on, whether it's in the lab or through simulations. Um, and one of the things that I like most about the work I do is, is just the exercise of putting together all of these processes and looking at what happens. And so what does happen when we put all of that together? So the next few slides focus on some of the work that I did during my PhD, um, in which I looked at the formation of a temporary atmosphere in the aftermath of a comet impact on the moon. And that's motivated by the fact that we have several lines of evidence that suggest that comets might have played some role in del delivering water, not only to the moon, but also to Mercury. And so we use the method that I talked about on the last couple of slides to simulate that process. So in this case, uh, we considered a two kilometer diameter comet, sort of average size for a comet. Um, in this particular simulation, that comet came in at an angle. It impacted at the lunar north pole, which, you know, of course, impacts can happen anywhere. The, the surface of the moon is, is peppered with craters. Uh, but for, for computation reasons of, of really computational simplicity, we considered an impact at the north pole. Um, and when a comet strikes, in this case, it was at 30 kilometers per second, which is sort of average speed for a comet in the inner solar system. Uh, the ice within that comet vaporizes, and that gives rise to this expanding cloud of water vapor, which is what you see here in this movie that's, uh, that's running on a loop. The colors indicate the speed of that water vapor. The arrows indicate the direction in which uh, that water vapor is moving. And so what you see is the formation of this cloud of water vapor that is expanding fairly rapidly to surround the entire moon. And in fact, if we fast forward to six hours after the impact, you'll see that this expanding cloud has, has grown and now the colors indicate density. Um, and this plot and a few, of the a few of the successive ones were made at a time uh, when I didn't realize that you could make the rainbow color bar less green. And so these are going to be some, some very um, green figures here, but, um, but I hope still interesting. So six hours after impact, that water vapor has expanded to many, many lunar radii away from the moon. You can see that some of the water vapor has begun to fall back to the surface. The rest is sort of still moving out, but eventually, um, some of the water vapor, all of the water vapor that doesn't escape lunar gravity altogether, falls back to the lunar surface. And in fact, that temporary atmosphere uh, can last for a few lunar days. And remember, one lunar day is a month, hence, um, hence the term month from moon. So one of the interesting things that we found is that a comet impact generated atmosphere has a certain characteristic structure. The moon is, is a strange place. It has an interesting and, and quite dramatic thermal environment. The lunar night side is so cold that any water vapor that falls back to the night side simply collapses to the surface. And so the night side is too cold and the rotation of the moon is too slow um, for that hemisphere to really support an atmosphere. On the date side though, something different happens. So you have this water vapor, it's expanded all the way around the moon, it's beginning to fall back. It falls back at tremendously high speeds. And when it collides with that warm day side surface, it forms a shock, or in other words, that cold, fast vapor slows down due to a collision with the surface, essentially. It gets heated, it gets compressed, and you get pressure-driven winds um, that tend to sort of sweep water vapor across the lunar surface uh, to the poles and also to the night side uh, where, where it can stay safe until sunrise. You'll also notice that there's this, this feature antipodal to the point of impact. And so what's happening there is that you have this water vapor cloud 
it's expanded around the moon and it's sort of collided with itself. It's reconverged. Um, and again, you get a shock, which is what happens when supersonic vapor collides with more supersonic vapor. Um, it gets compressed. And in this case, um, you see this jet light feature that drives um, water vapor down towards the surface. And so I show you this to emphasize the point really that these atmospheres can be strange. We, we haven't really seen anything like this in, in the solar system. And of course, the way to test it is, is by trying to connect um, models like this to observations, which is tricky to do, but, but something that we're, we're working towards. Um, but this is an interesting problem. We, you know, just by looking at what happens to the molecules, um, by going in with our best understanding of the microscopic physics and chemistry, we can reconstruct these pictures um, that, that hopefully will, will turn out to be useful, but, but they are certainly interesting. Ultimately, around only around 1% of the water delivered by a comet, and this varies depending on the size of your comet and how fast it's traveling, but around 1% of the water that's delivered by the comet is cold trapped in, in those cold regions near the poles where it can be geologically stable. Um, this, this plot here is a representative map of the lunar south polar region. I've, I've put some craters in here as white circles for, for scale. Um, there are more of them. These are some of the bigger ones that are in permanent shadow. And the colors here indicate the thickness of this transient frost that you form on the lunar night side. Everything that's blue here is the day side, which is too warm to accumulate frost. And of course, the days and nights pass by on the moon. Um, these frost patterns change. But another one of the interesting consequences of this simulation, and this again is getting back to that question of how do you relate something that happened or maybe didn't happen billions of years ago, to what you can see today. So we get an idea of how much of the water from a comet could, could remain behind all the way to the present day. And our simulations also showed us that that water could be non-uniformly distributed. So in this case, um, and again, this was one specific scenario, but we found that if you had a comet impact in the Northern Hemisphere, um, for this set of impact parameters, you actually ended up with more water, with thicker deposits of water at the South Pole. Um, so water doesn't fall back uniformly everywhere. It can be non-uniformly distributed between poles and even between individual craters. And that's important information to have when we're trying to make that connection between uh, processes that occurred billions of years ago and the evidence that we can observe today. And this is very much a story that is continuing uh, to evolve. One of the most interesting discoveries, in my view, um, of the last 10 years has been the finding that mercury um, has fairly abundant water ice. The, the innermost planet of the solar system um, has significant amounts of water ice at its poles. And that's a bit of a mystery. You have these two rocky bodies in the inner solar system, Mercury and the Moon, and yet water ice is, is abundant. It's, it's almost everywhere where it's thermally stable on Mercury, but on the Moon, there just isn't as much water ice as, as one might expect from just running thermal models. Um, in fact, the water ice appears to be patchy and we don't understand why it is where it is. Um, and there's so much less of it. And, and why is that? And so that I think is, is one of the, the big, outstanding, interesting questions um, for, for the next decade of, of planetary science. There's also been a renewed recognition in the last few years that a volcanism not only resurfaced um, a large part of, of the lunar surface, but volcanism also inevitably involves volatiles. Um, you know, volatiles exolve when, when magma reaches the surface. Where did those volatiles go? And, and are there traces of those ancient volcanic atmospheres um, if, if they existed? Or are, what, you know, what traces of that ancient volcanic outgassing are preserved today? And what could we potentially observe? 
Um, that's another question that we've sort of begun to investigate in more depth of late, and that and that is very very far uh, from being answered. But it's it's really a fascinating problem. And so, well, if we go back for a moment, and so with with all of these intriguing questions, as you might guess. Um, there is a lot of interest in returning to the lunar surface and perhaps visiting the poles to, to really get ground truth of, of the things that we think we might see from orbit um, and to really verify some of those observations. But that's where things start to get really interesting, um, even more interesting, because when a spacecraft descends to land on the lunar surface, um, it has to fire its engines to slow down. When a spacecraft fires its engines, it burns rocket fuel. And when you burn rocket fuel, you release volatiles. You produce the things that in some cases you might be going there to measure. When spacecraft fire their thrusters, they can generate um, exhaust gases. And those exhaust gases might include water, carbon dioxide, ammonia, all things that we've detected on the moon from that one point impact into Kamea's crater. Um, are also present uh, and released by spacecraft. And so this, this isn't something new. So like most great ideas I have, someone else had this idea back in the 60s. And, and in fact, this was something that was well recognized during the, the, the Apollo era. And, and the chart that you see here, that is a mass spectrum. And the white bars and the gray bars show you how much um, or rather the concentration of exhaust gases measured on the moon in the aftermath of the Apollo 12 landing. So the, the white bars here show you how much of a certain species was measured 14 hours after Apollo 12 landed. And then the gray bars show you how much persists, how much of each of these different molecules persists 58 days, so two months, two lunar days after landing. And this is really the, the opportunity um, to, to conduct these sort of science, science measurements is really an opportunity to understand how volatiles interact with the lunar surface. One of the big unknowns um, in doing the kind of modeling I do, for instance, is just how exactly does, does a water molecule or any other molecule interact with this ancient rocky um, rough on an extremely fine scale and space weathered surface. Um, by measuring exhaust gases, by conducting this almost inevitable volatile release experiment, we have an opportunity to understand that. And there's also an operational need to understand the same thing. So if you're trying to plan a mission, you're going to the moon to measure water, um, but you're also releasing water on the way down, you need to understand where those gases go if you want to do things like make decisions about how far to rove or how long to wait before you measure water on the surface or in the exosphere. And so, there, so there's a real motivation to, to sort of look into this problem of, of what happens when a spacecraft lands on the lunar exosphere. This sort of um, and, you know, environmental science meets lunar science in a way. And so we recently modeled this. We took the same tools that we've been applying um, to very different scenarios, and we modeled the transport of water vapor that was released during a spacecraft landing. So we considered a uh, Chang'e 3 class spacecraft. So Chang'e 3 was the Chinese lander, um, not, not the latest one, but the one before that, uh, which landed around 45 degrees north latitude. But we took a spacecraft about that size because we knew its landing trajectory. Um, and we moved that landing trajectory to 70 degrees south latitude. So we thought, okay, well, we're interested in going to high latitudes. Let's look at what happens during a high latitude landing. So we consider this, this nominal landing scenario. So the spacecraft descends, um, it fires its engines for around 150 seconds or uh, a few minutes, it releases, not a whole lot, it releases around 43 kilograms of H2O. It releases other stuff as well, but for this simulation we focused on the H2O. And so this plot here is a snapshot um, of what the surface and exosphere look like five seconds after the spacecraft begins firing its engines. So here you see the spacecraft, 
it's really too small to see on the scale, but it's magnified so you can see it um, in, in all that's very lifelike glory. Um, but the spacecraft follows this descent trajectory that's, that's marked here in pink. And so as the spacecraft descends, it releases water vapor. That water vapor expands into space. It falls back. That's basically what, what happens in, in all of these simulations. Um, and so in, in this figure here, you're looking at, at two perpendicular planes. So you have one plane that's, assi that's aligned rather with the descent trajectory. And the blues here show the density of water vapor in the exosphere. Um, and so you'll notice that even though the density is many orders of magnitude greater than the typical background density of the lunar exosphere, uh, this is still an exceedingly thin exosphere because you know, it's, it's not a whole, amount of, whole lot of water. And then you're also looking at a plane that's tangent to the lunar surface. And so the grayscale colors here show you how much water vapor is absorbed to the lunar surface. If we go to the next slide, we can animate this to try and get some intuition for, for what's going on. And so this is a fairly close up view. Um, the spacecraft is, still, is too, still too small to see on this scale, but you can sort of tell where its position is by looking at where the densest uh, part of this water vapor cloud is. And so the spacecraft is descending, it's releasing more and more water vapor into the exosphere that's expanding out into space, it's falling back onto the lunar surface. And we can zoom all the way out to look at what happens at the global scale. So our landing, our simulated landing, was at 70 degrees south around where my cursor is. Um, and you can see um, that in one of these cases, the water vapor tends to be concentrated here. But what these two figures are showing you is that that exhaust water vapor on the moon, where there's nothing to stop it, the water vapor is really globally dispersed. And what we, our, our best understanding of, of what, what we, our theoretical picture of what happens is that that water vapor tends to absorb to the cold lunar night side. And so these two figures here um, show views of the lunar surface and exosphere at three hours after the landing. So the spacecraft has landed. There, there's no more water vapor coming from the spacecraft. We're looking at what happens to that wood vapor after the landing. So these are two views at the same um, instant in time. What's different about these two views is the value that we assume for the binding energy, which is what I denoted by E sub A here. And so the binding energy is the value that describes how strongly water molecules stick to the lunar surface. Uh, when you have a higher binding energy, water molecules tend to bind more strongly to, to the silicate surface. When the binding energy is lower, water molecules are freer to move. So that's the difference between these two cases. The purples here, you're looking down at the lunar night side hemisphere. And so the colors indicate how much water is absorbed to the lunar night side. The night side is cold, but it warms up pretty rapidly at sunrise as the moon rotates slowly into the sun. Um, when the surface warms up, those water molecules are absorbed, and they're then free to move over the warm day side surface. And some of those molecules might make it all the way to the poles. And so this, this ring around, um, around the lunar surface is, is again, it's, you're looking at the exospheric density in a plane that's aligned with the descent trajectory. And one thing you'll notice by comparing these two cases is, is that they're different. And so, in fact, one of our takeaways from doing this sort of simulation was that if we're able to observe this in future um, lunar landings, because these are things you can observe, you can look at how much water is in the exosphere, you can look at how much water is absorbed to the lunar surface. If, if we can observe, observe this during future lunar landings, that offers us a way to test some of the assumptions that we make in our models and assumptions that are important, not just understanding where the water from a spacecraft goes, but, but also to understanding where the water from a comet went um, or where the water from a volcanic outgassing event went. Um, and so essentially what we would like to do going forward is to, is to treat this as an iterative process. We run the models, 
we take observations and depending on how closely the models and observations agree, we tweak the model parameters until we build up this picture of what really happens to volatiles in the lunar environment. We can also step this forward through time, three hours after landing. Here we are six hours after landing. Here we are 24 hours after landing. And because the moon is rotating so slowly, the night side still remains the, the night side in, in these views. But this exosphere, the spacecraft generated exosphere continues to evolve even after 24 hours, which is hardly no time on the moon. And in fact, we ran out these simulations for two lunar days, two months after landing. So there are several lines on, um, on this plot that track what happens to water vapor over the course of two lunar days. So don't worry if you can't digest all of the um, lines in, in one glimpse. And, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides afterwards as well in case anyone wants to take a closer look. But the main takeaways here are that even two lunar days after landing, around 10 to 30 percent of the water that was released by a spacecraft remains in the lunar environment. Most of that is temporarily absorbed to the lunar night side. In the long run, uh, most water ultimately gets dissociated by solar ultraviolet radiation, but the rest can actually make its way to permanently shattered regions. And so there, uh, so we might expect perhaps some, some traces of lunar landings to accumulate in the geological record at the North and South Poles, just, just traces. Um, those traces aren't uniformly distributed. And in fact, we found that craters that are closer to the landing trajectory, and this is important if you're planning a mission to the lunar poles, craters closer to the landing site might actually tend to accumulate more water and, um, and other exosvolatiles. So just to put this in, in perspective a little bit, um, this, was, this was sort of one simulation. And this is a, a problem and an opportunity that's likely to become more and more important uh, going forward because some of the human landing systems currently under development are planning to land much closer to the poles. They're also much heavier. When you have heavier landers, you can have many orders of magnitude more um, of, of water, carbon dioxide, and other species uh, generated and, and released into the lunar exosphere. Doing these sort of predictions, these sort of environmental impact predictions is, is tricky because there's still a whole lot that we don't understand. There are still yawning gaps in our understanding of how volatiles interact with the lunar surface, for instance, what's the right value of binding energy to use? You know, I have colleagues doing lab experiments, important lab experiments, to try and understand that, but, but it is hard to recreate the lunar surface in a lab. And so this remains something that we don't fully understand. We also have, you know, we really only just scratched the surface or barely scratched the surface when it comes to understanding what sort of physical and chemical processes operate in the polar microenvironment. So we have these regions, the coldest places in the solar system. We've never been anywhere like this before. Um, they're exceedingly cold, they're dark. Um, the energy sources, galactic cosmic rays and so on, are, are you know, um, are, are, we, we don't fully understand how those energy sources interact with the surface in terms of what sort of physics and chemistry they produce. This is almost, you know, visiting the lunar poles is almost like landing on the surface of a body in the outer reaches of the solar system in terms of some of the environmental parameters. We also don't have a good handle on what's already there, which is, uh, which is challenging when, um, w when trying to account for what you brought with you um, and, and, and trying to distinguish that from, from what was already there. And then, of course, this talk focused largely on water, but water is only one of several exospecies. It's also only one of several lunar volatiles, all of which have their own interesting stories to tell. So I'm not going to launch into a talk on lunar argon, but you know, argon, for instance, has its, has its own stories to tell about outgassing and, and, and many other interesting things. Each volatile is, is special in its own way. And the reason I wanted to share this, this story of, of 
spacecraft generated exospheres would use? Because I think this is really one of the next big questions in planetary science. So we're going to these, these strange worlds and exploring them up close in ways we haven't done before. And I think there's a, a really interesting and compelling question there um, to be investigated in, in terms of how do we change these strange environments when we, when we visit them? I think that's, that's a scientifically rich question of its own and one that's, that's also important to answer. And so looking ahead, I think the, the two main messages I want to leave you with, one is that there is this intriguing geological record that's written at the poles of Mercury. And to read that record, we need to understand how it was constructed. And that calls on us to understand how ancient lunar atmosphere rose and fell, how the exosphere behaves today, and the lunar volatile system um, is, is fascinating. And you know, I, I, going into grad school, I thought maybe one day I'd be done studying the different things. Um, and has many unsolved mysteries. And, and I think one of the things that makes this such an exciting area of, of science to work in is, is that it's, 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 it's richly interdisciplinary. Um, there are measurements to be made from the orbit and at the surface. Um, there are lab experiments and numerical models to run and, and all of these wonderful stories to, to piece together. So those are the two messages that I, I really wanted you to leave, wanted to leave you with, even if you take nothing away from this. And then the background here is the illuminated rim of Shackleton Crater, which happens to sit nicely right at the lunar south pole. And everything that's black in, uh, in this image, I haven't faded it out. This is what permanent shadow looks like. Um, you know, everything that's, that's black in, in this view is also part of the image. This is the permanently shadowed interior of Shackleton Crater sitting in a sea of permanent shadow at the South Pole. And it's beautiful. So, as I make all this in the world for my PhD, uh, David Goldstein and me, um, at APL, um, you know, as I said, if no one thought of it in, in, in the 60s, Dana Hurley thought of it um, in, in the 90s and, and 2000s. Dana, Dana is fantastic. Um, she, she's done a lot of amazing work on lunar volatiles. Uh, ben, Wes, and Dave Blewett, um, are the instigators of, of some of the other work I do in well, with respect to infrared, radar, and uh, polarimetric remote sensing. Um, Nancy Chabot, Carolyn Ernst, and Ellie McFarland are my co-conspirators on, on Mercury. Um, and of course, the whole planetary exploration group is, is just a wonderful group to work with. Um, a lot of the work I do is motivated by my involvement in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Mission, LRO, which has been in orbit for over 10 years now. Um, we also have this, this wonderful institute called the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, or SERVI. Um, so SERVI is a virtual institute. It's composed of, of teams that are spread out across the country. It's a, it's a great institution to be part of. Um, I am a member of... Um, two current survey teams, Leader and ICE-50, and one former survey team, Dream2. Um, and then the simulations I do were carried out using supercomputers at the Texas Advanced Computing, Computing Center, which has computers named, because it's Texas, the computers are named Stampede and Lone Star, and the storage system is named Ranch. I use Stampede. Um, and if you ever need a supercomputer, um, one excellent way to get access to one is through this NSF program called Exceed. And so if, if you need a friendly neighborhood supercomputer, I highly recommend um, checking that out. And then here to close out is our APL fleet chart. These are the various spacecraft that we have throughout the solar system. Um, and you know, if, if you're ever on the East Coast, come and visit us and we'll tell you all about these and show you the models of, of some of them that we have hanging up in our, in our lobby. And so with that, I will stop my screen share and hopefully we have time for a few questions.